Good morning, everyone out there. Uh, Nick Lund here, uh, Outreach and Network Manager from Maine Audubon. Um, welcome to morning two, two of two for the second annual 2020 Rangeley Birding Festival. That's a lot of twos today. It's the, it's the second morning of two for the 2020 Rangeley Birding Festival, the second ever. Um, we're so glad to have you back or to have you join us for the first time if, uh, if this is the first morning. Um, uh, I want to thank again yesterday's excellent presentations from Doug Hitchcock and Pete McKinley uh, and from Kevin Sinnott and the Loon Crews crew who um, put together, thanks to Maine Mountain Media, an incredible um, virtual Loon Crews that uh, was really great. So um, thanks to those. And uh, for those who didn't hear me just a minute ago, we are working on posting those online uh, as well as the content today. Um, so folks can uh, watch it again and again if they want to, or, uh, or if they weren't able to join, watch it for the first time. So thank you. Um, so again, uh, this is the Rangeley Birding Festival. Uh, we had hoped to do the second annual festival in person, obviously, uh, but uh, the world conspired against us. So um, thank you for uh, joining with us as we pivot to this virtual festival, um, which I think has been a lot of fun. Uh, but of course, I have to say, it's no substitute for the real thing. So I hope everyone out there who is uh, inspired by these talks and who uh, uh, wants to visit the Rangeley area and see all these birds in person, um, please stay tuned for information about the actual third annual Rangeley Birding Festival uh, this time, sometime next year, um, because uh, we'd love to see all your faces and actually go bird together in person. So, uh, so stay tuned there. Um, Let's uh, just covering quick recap of the morning. Uh, the agenda for Thursday the 4th is out the window. We did that already. Um, today, this morning on the Friday the 5th, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to get started on a presentation called State of the Birds, uh, which talks about uh, um, the reasons why various bird populations in Maine have fluctuated over the years. Um, at 10 a.m., uh, photographer Nick Ledley uh, from touchthewildphotos.com and who has a storefront there in Rangeley, um, expert wildlife photographer, is going to come on and uh, give a presentation about wildlife photography 101, which is great. And then following that at 11 a.m. is our keynote speech from Fre Professor Brian Olson of the University of Maine. Uh, he's a very entertaining, smart, fun guy. Uh, and he's going to be doing a presentation about uh, lumps and splits, uh, species and field guides. It's going to be really fun. So stay tuned all morning. Uh, you can come in and out as you need to. Um, and this is, like I said, being recorded, so there'll be opportunities to catch up later. So that's the schedule. And I'm going to turn it over to David Miller uh, from Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust to, uh, to thank some folks. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, First of all, what a great day yesterday, uh, inspirational, and it was amazing to begin to understand more deeply the incredible biodiversity and birds we have in Maine's Western Mountains. So I want to join Nick with inviting all of you to come, come up uh, in person and experience Rangeley in the region for yourself. Uh, I'd like to just take a minute to thank uh, first my colleagues at Maine Audubon. This would not be the way it is without them. So thank you so much to uh, Nick, Doug, uh, Laura, and the whole organization. Uh, we have support from uh, the Maine Office of Tourism for this year and probably next year's festival, um, as well as the Betterment Fund. I want to thank them and all of our partners that we work with uh, through the year to make Rangeley a birding destination. Uh, and let me just take uh, a few seconds to kind of back up now and set, set some context, set the stage for today. So both uh, Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust, my organization, and Maine Audubon are conservation organizations. And we would not have the bird life, the wildlife we have without the uh, many, many years of efforts by the part of hundreds of thousands, millions of people to conserve uh, the beautiful nation and world country we have. And uh, I wanna encourage all of us to continue supporting both your local land trust who conserves land right near you and your local Maine Audubon chapter. Uh, <clears throat> without, without this kind of work going on in perpetuity, we risk losing what we love more than anything. Uh, I spent just a, a couple minutes this morning 
looking into the derivation of the word conserve, which I often do. Uh, and it is interesting. Usually it comes down to, uh, from Latin uh, originally, to, uh, to, to save, to preserve together, to pres work together to preserve something. Uh, but if you go deeper into the roots, the, the serve, the, from sir, which is the uh, Indo-European, the original, if there's a, a, coming straight from some of the original human languages, it means to keep watch. And it is interesting to think about bird watching. <laughs> Certainly we're out there birding, bird watching, looking at birds. We're actually also keeping watch over uh, something that we love so much. And the reason we love it is we're part of it. And uh, in reality, we share the same cellular, the same cells that all these living creatures we see around us um, have. So it's not something separate from us. We're protecting ourselves when we protect uh, the natural world. And uh, we, are sh we share the same fate. So thank you again for all of your work. I know many of you, probably all of you, work hard to take care of uh, the wonderful world we have, the natural world. Thank you for that. And yes, please look to support your local conservation groups, land trusts, your local Maine uh, Audubon chapter. And uh, looking forward to a great morning. So thank you very much. And uh, Nick, back to you. Okay, thank you, David. Let's get going, shall we? Uh, nine, oh man, nine, I, I gotta go. So hopefully I'm gonna go through this presentation quickly. Uh, we'll leave some time for questions and then, uh, and then we'll rock and roll. Um, State of the birds. Decades of Change. This is a, a presentation originally developed by my uh, much smarter and handsomer colleague, Doug Hitchcock. Um, I've sort of adapted it to my own ends. So I want to thank him for putting together a lot of the ideas uh, at the beginning and a lot of the photos probably too. So um, what are we talking about today? Well, I got to do this quickly first. This is, uh, I'm contractually obligated to say, tell you that uh, Maine Audubon is the largest and oldest wildlife conservation in the state of Maine. We've been around since 1843, if you can believe that. Uh, we've got 10,000 members around the state, 2,000 volunteers. We got seven chapters. Uh, the closest to Rangeley is the Western, uh, Western Maine chapter based out of Farmington. Um, eight wildlife sanctuaries, including uh, Borestone Mountain up in the, the uh, Rangeley area. Um, we connect people to wildlife, that's what we do um, in Maine. So we have uh, robust education programs where we teach thousands of kids about uh, nature and wildlife. Uh, we have conservation programs, we have scientists out on the ground monitoring populations of animals, and then uh, advocacy program to bring what we found from our scientists to Augusta to try to tell those people uh, the right way to protect me. So if you're not part of our world already, please join us. Uh, decades of change. Okay, so this presentation we're talking about uh, bird populations in Maine and why they have fluctuated for various reasons um, over the years. Um, there are uh, quite a few reasons. Some are mysterious, uh, some are natural uh, variations in populations, um, and many of them are, have changed because of human uh, one way or another. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the, the varieties and some of the reasons that some bird populations are changing today. But we should start with by talking about what's a range, right? Why, why do birds have different ranges? Uh, well, birds have different ranges because they like different things. They have different habitats, they eat different things. Um, and so uh, over the years, birds have developed different areas to live based on those needs. Um, we'll use here two similar uh, species. These are two warblers. Uh, on the left is the yellow warbler and the yellow rumped warbler on the right. Uh, they're both, you know, pretty closely related in the scheme of things. Uh, but they've, uh, because of, you know, slight divergences in their habitat preferences and their food, um, they've uh, developed very different ranges, as you can see from the maps up above. Um, so just so we are clear, uh, the red is their summer habitat for these birds, the yellow is sort of migratory transition habitat, the blue is where they spend their winters. Um, and as you can see, for example, the yellow rump warbler, um, they, their blue area is much higher, far further north than the yellow warbler. Um, the yellow rump warbler can spend, ha has learned to be able to tolerate colder temperatures, be able, uh, learn to eat some fruit. Um, and so consequently has been able to spend some, some time of their winter in areas where there aren't a lot of insects to eat. Um, the yellow warbler, on the other hand, just eats insects. And so uh, uh, it can't spend any time in a place where there aren't insects. And so uh, in the winter, it needs to get somewhere warm where there's bugs to eat. Uh, in the summer, they can come north. And so um, ranges change uh, based on the species. 
Uh, it's not just these warblers, but uh, here's a range of another lovely bird, a uh, common loon. Um, common loon, uh, they have evolved to nest on uh, freshwater lakes. Um, the trouble with a freshwater lake, uh, and I should say this map is sort of the inverse of the last one. The blue is the summer habitat and the red is the winter habitat. Um, I didn't make these maps, but that is kind of confusing. So uh, in the winter, they are out on the ocean. And in the summer, they're, uh, they're inland. Um, you know, the trouble, uh, uh, lakes are a great place to nest. They're calm. There's lots of fish there. But the trouble is you can't spend the winter on a lake if you're a bird because it's frozen solid, right? So um, loons have evolved to find open water in the winter, and that means the ocean for them. So that's what ranges mean. Let's talk about a couple ranges that have that changed fluctually or bird populations that have changed uh, naturally, sorry. Um, so first of all, we should say that uh, lots of birds ranges have changed uh, in the past 18,000 years because 18,000 years ago, Maine was covered entirely by ice. Um, I don't know what was there before, maybe some, uh, some penguins, I don't know. Um, but there certainly wasn't much. And so as the ice has receded from the previous ice age in the past 18,000 years, um, almost all bird species have moved up and changed their range to, to become into Maine um, in that time. Um, so uh, here's one of them. Uh, this is a beautiful bird, uh, one that you could possibly see at Rangeley, um, sort of an elusive denizen of the northern forest. This is an east, uh, northern or, I'm sorry, evening grosbeak. I've had one cup of coffee, which is not enough. Uh, an evening grosbeak, a uh, very beautiful um, finch bird with a big bill that can crush seeds um, and just beautiful colors. Um, this is a bird that, um, uh, as you'll see, uh, sort of disappeared recently. So um, this is a, a sightings map for evening grosbeak in Maine, um, starting on the left at 1960. Um, you can see that the sightings sort of uh, burst up in the uh, 70s and 80s. People were seeing these birds much more frequently. And then uh, early 90s, their populations crashed, absolutely crashed. Um, and it was a real mystery what was going on. Um, people didn't know um, what the reason was for the sudden decline in, in this beautiful bird. Um, and there were sort of some, some similar species uh, facing a similar declines. Um, that up on the top left is a female evening grosbeak. Um, on the top right is a bay-breasted warbler. Uh, down here is a Cape May warbler on the left, and then a Tennessee warbler in the flowers. Um, each of these birds uh, was experiencing declines, and uh, people didn't really know why. Um, switch here. Uh, until they discovered a link between uh, this insect and those birds. So, um, like I said, sort of with the yellow warbler, birds eat insects. A lot of these birds, especially migratory birds, um, eat insects and need insects to feed their babies. Um, insects are a major part of this, the summer diet of almost all birds um, because their uh, caterpillars especially are so filled with protein that they're great for raising baby birds. Um, and so uh, bir insects are really important to lots of birds. And um, scientists were beginning to understand that this insect called the spruce budworm um, was a major uh, diet, uh, a major important source of food for uh, evening grosbeaks and some of those migratory warblers. Um, Eastern spruce budworm is considered a pest. Um, like certain other insects, they have these uh, cyclical uh, patterns where they sort of have big outbreaks in the forest every 30 or so years. Um, and they can be fairly devastating to a spruce forest. Um, they uh, they um, devour leaves and they can um, uh, kill a lot of timber. Um, but they are extremely important to spruce budworms, as we're learning. And um, outbreaks of these uh, um, insects track very closely with uh, the population heights of uh, these native birds. So right here we can see um, a population map over a, just the past uh, between 14 and 18 of bay-breasted warbler, one of those warblers I showed you before. Um, and so what we are seeing now is sort of a, an emerging outbreak over the past couple years of spruce budworms. And so the question is to sort of prove the link between the two, will the populations of the birds rise along with the populations of the budworms? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, so you can see here, the purple line is the most recent. You can see it gets higher and higher and higher over recent years um, as they are recovering as more insects roam the landscape. Um, uh, this is a similar chart for Tennessee warbler. You can see it similarly peaks high. 
Um, and for Kate May Warbler, uh, again, the purple is at the top. So um, that was sort of a natural mystery going on. And what we've determined is that um, certain populations of these birds, even gross beaks and some of these migratory warblers, uh, naturally fluctuate along with populations of their favorite food source, the, east, the spruce budworm. Um, and so this is important uh, discoveries for, for management. Like I said, spruce problems are uh, uh, considered a large pest of the timber industry. Um, this is a airplane in the 60s spraying DDT down to try to kill uh, spruce budworms. So the more we know about uh, the benefits of spruce budworm, the more we can uh, plan for them and work, uh, uh, improve our management of the insects and our management of the nor northern forest to also protect birds. So that's sort of a natural fluctuation that we've discovered. Another natural fluctuation, this is sort of cheating, um, is this very cool bird, the uh, cattle egret. You can see down uh, in, the, um, in the lower left that uh, funky breeding plumage they have with this cool little colored mohawk. Um, cattle egret uh, is a, a primarily a um, old world bird. They live between uh, Europe and Africa. Um, and for the longest time, they didn't live in the United States at all, didn't live in, in uh, North or South America. Um, but in the early 30s, um, as birds are wont to do occasionally, a group of cattle egrets um, made it over to the Atlantic and landed in South America. They just showed up one day. Um, this happens from time to time, but uh, in previous years, whenever this would happen, um, these cattle egrets didn't fare well, or we don't know what happened to them. They, they follow uh, large herds of animals. So in Africa, they'll, they'll follow uh, you know, buffalo and, and uh, elephants and things like that. Um, when they showed up in the 30s in South America, they suddenly found some big animals around. They found cattle. Um, and so these uh, uh, cattle egret, which naturally made the jump across the ocean, um, suddenly had some, uh, suddenly felt sort of at home. Um, and since then, cattle egrets have spread all over North and South America. It's pretty incredible. So you can see here the sort of jumps that they've made over time. Um, from 1937, um, they spread down into Chile and South America by the 70s, and then up into North America in the 60s and 70s, and even as recently as the 2000s. Um, they're still very rare in Maine. It's rare to get cattle egrets, but down south, they're much more common. Um, and this is sort of part of their natural range expansion, facilitated by humans, um, but still, uh, still natural, so good for them. So that's sort of it for the natural changes. Um, birds ranges naturally were, were honed over thousands of years, and so um, don't change very much on their own. Uh, but humans have come along and, and uh, thrown many wrenches in the system. And um, because of our influence, lots of birds ranges have changed. So we're going to talk for the rest of the presentation about uh, things that we have done to facilitate uh, range expansion or contraction from different birds. Um, the first way that we've put our influence, our thumb on the scale, is by changing land use or um, removing habitat for certain birds. Like this guy. Um, one of the most beautiful birds out there. Um, this is an American kestrel, um, beautiful little falcon. Uh, not very big, uh, you know, uh, just a but, a but a terror. If you're a dragonfly or a grasshopper, uh, you do not want to see this bad boy coming at you. Um, a beautiful bird. Um, another uh, species. Uh, this is a tree swallow, a beautiful aerial insectivore. Sort of spend their whole life on the wing, not their whole life on the wing, but they they fly around in, in patterns like that. Uh, picking off aerial insects, um, really beautiful birds. Uh, and this one too, this very cool blackbird called a bobolink, um, the beautiful little yellow cat back there and um, a crazy song and display. Um, what do all these birds have in common? They are grassland specialists, right? So these birds all find, are right at home on the grasslands. Um, and the thing about grasslands uh, is they're not doing great in the state of Maine. Um, here are uh, some population maps in Maine of the American kestrel. Um, you can see that they have been declining since the 70s pretty, uh, pretty strongly. Um, that routes chart at the bottom is just to show you that the, that the data is steady here. Uh, there, um, we're, we're, it's just a sort of a control for the data. The population is, is steadily declining. Um, the way that a lot of bird uh, um, and conservationists keep track of bird populations is through these breeding bird atlases, um, which is a comprehensive survey of, of the breeding birds in any state. 
Um, Maine's Breeding Bird Atlas is underway right now. Kudos uh, to my friend Doug Hitchcock, who is leading the charge from Maine Audubon's end for the Maine Breeding Bird Atlas um, in conjunction with uh, the state of Maine and other organizations. Um, ours is almost done, um, so we can't sort of share the data. We don't have the data done yet, but uh, Massachusetts recently uh, finished theirs. Uh, and so we can infer from Massachusetts uh, how Maine birds may be doing. So this is the, the American Kestrel change map for, from the Massachusetts Breeding Bird Survey. Um, the red triangle means that there was a decrease in population, and you can see it's nothing but red triangles down here. Um, so well, this is just to show you that in a state sort of similar to Maine, um, kestrels are also not doing very well at all. Um, uh, similarly, those other species, the tree swallow and the bobolink, are uh, facing sharp declines. Why is that? Because we sort of changed their habitat, right? Um, there aren't nearly as many grasslands or open meadows as there used to be. Um, this is a map of uh, farmland in the state of Maine uh, since 1850. Um, and you can see here that uh, the percentage of the state in farmland um, used to be much, much higher than it was now. So farmland and grassland were great habitats for some of these birds. Um, in the 1880s, about 30% of the entire state of Maine was uh, farmland, which is, which is, you think about what that would mean for the landscape, that's a lot of land. Um, now it's down uh, just over 5%. Um, and so all of those, uh, uh, all of that could have been habitat. The, but there's good news. Through the efforts of Maine Audubon and many others, um, we have worked to protect uh, piping clover nests on beaches throughout the state, and we're, we're doing a great job. We're kicking some butt. Um, this here is a map of piping clover nests in, um, in blue and fledgling birds, and young baby birds um, in red, um, that um, uh, oops, over the years. And as you can see that from a low in the early 80s, we are up over, uh, you know, as of 2015, 60 nests um, with more than 120 birds fledged. This chart is way out of date. Um, we're up nearing 100 nests now on uh, Maine's beaches after um, uh, a couple record years. Uh, that uh, article below is from last year uh, where we have record numbers of uh, nesting piping clovers and um, you know, the early word is that it's another fantastic year in Maine for these birds. Um, another beach nesting bird is the least tern, um, a, a very adorable little tern, terns of these agile little seabirds. Um, likewise, uh, they're doing much better in the state of Maine, thanks to our efforts. So um, the lesson here is that we, if we, when we change our land use habits and be more aware of what we're doing, uh, the birds will bounce back. Another bird you may be surprised that has changed because of land use is this gorgeous little guy here. This is, a, of course, a northern cardinal. Um, northern cardinals used to be very rare in Maine. Did you know that? Um, in the 60s and, and earlier, um, there were almost no cardinals. It was a big deal when you saw a cardinal. Um, but uh, as you can see from this chart, their, their numbers have exploded in Maine. Of course, you see them everywhere now. Um, why is that? It's largely due to our change in land use. As humans have come up and um, put houses up and then planted uh, a lot of things that are that cardinals love, especially like bushes and uh, low berry uh, producing bushes, um, cardinals have moved into that habitat. So um, uh, that's why they're so common around people and in our backyards because they love sort of the low bushes and the shrubs that we've planted for them that otherwise weren't here. Eastern bluebirds are another one. Um, even more recently than uh, cardinals, you can see here just even in the early 2000s, uh, bluebirds in the winter, this is in the Christmas bird count, were very rare, um, but uh, their numbers have gone up. Uh, this is uh, due again to uh, bluebirds being able to eat berries in the winter and as humans are planting more plants that have food sources for them throughout the year, uh, they, don't, they are migrating less frequently. Um, you know, migrating is dangerous and it takes time and uh, it's, you know, if they're like me, it's pretty lazy. Um, so that if there's food, then they'll just stick around. So bluebirds are um, a recipient of that. What you, get, what you can do to help land use changes? Well, there's a lot of things. Um, uh, there's movements to let your um, lawns grow up if you can to keep some better habitat. Really, the best thing you can do is plant native plants. So I, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, native insects are critical to the survival of birds. Um, birds eat insects and they need caterpillars to survive. Um, and uh, a lot of caterpillars don't survive on trees um, that haven't been here for a very long time. Um, a lot of insects have very close relationships with specific species of plants, trees, and so you need those uh, trees if you want to have the caterpillars to feed the baby birds. 
Uh, and so what you got to do is plant native plants. Uh, Maine Audubon just launched our awesome native plant finder at mainnativeplants.org. Um, and we have a plant sale, native plant sale coming up in a few weeks, um, all going to be online this year. You'll pick them up in person, but all your ordering is online. Stay tuned for that. It's a fantastic way to uh, make a garden look beautiful and to support native insects and native plants. So check it out. All right, um, the second way that we have uh, changed bird populations over the years is through direct interaction. Um, here's a culprit of that. This, uh, what a handsome devil this is. Of course, a wild turkey. Um, you all know that uh, wild turkeys were, uh, were extinct in Maine, extirpated from Maine um, uh, in the early, you know, 100 years ago. Um, this is through direct interaction of hunting. So there was um, some, you know, loss of their habitat, but a lot of just unregulated hunting um, led the wild turkey to be uh, not found in Maine at all uh, 100 years ago. Um, here is a map on the left I mentioned earlier before we were so rudely interrupted about um, uh, bird atlases. Um, this is uh, on the left the image from the previous bird atlas from the early 80s. You can see that uh, the, the black dots there are the presence of wild turkeys. You can see there are only a few of them. Um, these were reintroduced birds uh, mostly from the Adirondacks uh, in mid coast and southern Maine, um, but they were not widespread. Um, this was just 30, 40 years ago. Um, the other, the map on the right is um, the blue dots are wild turkey sightings uh, recently. And you can see, look, everywhere. Um, they are coming back in large numbers. They're supposed to be here. They are native here. Um, and we uh, changed our direct interaction, changed our hunting practices, and um, they have returned to where they should be. Um, actually, you can see here um, from the Massachusetts Atlas, wild turkey is the number one species that has changed the most in a positive way. They have grown the most more than any other species in Massachusetts, and we suspect that the map will look similar to me. Here's another one. Cheers for this guy. Drink your coffee for this one. Bald eagle. Um, of course we know that bald eagles uh, were in a terrible state in the 50s and 60s. Um, the, the insecticide, uh, pesticide DDT um, caused their eggs to become very fragile and, and brittle and when the birds would actually sit on the eggs they would crack and break and babies would die. Um, so there were very few eagles uh, in the state of Maine and around the country um, in the middle part of the century. Um, but they have bounced back. Uh, we banned DDT, of course, and um, the birds responded. Um, here's a map of um, eagles in Maine um, starting in 1945 and then ending um, 2013, and you can see a, a market increase there. There are almost no eagles in Maine um, uh, you know, in the 40s and 50s, and now they're much more common to see um, if, you, if you make the effort. Another one is loons, common loons. Um, the direct interaction there is fishing, right? So um, uh, loons don't have teeth, they swallow their food whole, they need to chew it up, and so what they do is they have a thing called a gizzard, they swallow stones and put them in their gizzard, and then when their food comes in, they crush up the food with their stones in their stomach, uh, and that's how they sort of chew. Um, and so that's how a lot of you know, uh, birds do it, a lot of diving birds. The trouble is that when humans uh, drop their fishing tackle off their, off their lures, um, it mixes with the stones at the bottom of the seabed. So um, here's a picture of a, a typical seabed um, filled with stones. This is where a loon might go to get some stones for its gizzard. Um, and if you can see here, huh, it looks pretty normal to me. Um, the yellow is a lead tackle that is sunk to the bottom that, has, um, that is blended in with the ground. So you can see here, it's almost impossible to tell in this clear you know, picture without any water and sediment in the way where the lead tackle is. If you're a loon, there's no way. You don't even know what lead is. Uh, and so um, this is how loons ingest lead from our fishing lines into their bodies. And lead kills them, just like a human's ingesting lead. So I'll show you again how, how hard that is. This is why lead tackle is such a problem. Um, loons are, um, uh, have lots of problems, uh, climate change, water quality, um, people getting too close to boats, in their boats, frankly. Um, but it's another success story. Um, when we work to educate ourselves about the issues facing loons and to pass laws banning uh, bear lead tackle, um, the population of loon bounces back. So this is um, uh, a slide from uh, uh, our loon count program that shows that the population of loons in southern Maine has about doubled um, since the early 80s. So um, direct interaction, when you can recognize it and stop it, it, it helps. Here's a fun one. These are house finches. You guys probably all seen these maybe at your backyard uh, bird feeders here in Maine. They're not native to Maine. Did you know that? Um, they, are, they are a sort of a recent development. Um, the story with, with house finches is they were a popular cage bird 
captured from their native ranges out in the southwest and sold out east uh, as Hollywood finches. This, they gave them a sexy new name, Hollywood finches. Um, when there was a crackdown on, uh, on captured birds, it's, it's illegal in the U.S. to capture native birds and sell them, um, pet stores just sort of released them into the air. Um, especially in New York City, there was a big release. And because of that, in the 40s or so, um, uh, house finches took off. They sort of established themselves all across the east. And so you can see here now the current range map for house finches has this interesting east-west split where there are, you know, this, this introduced population out east and is uh, the native population out west and they're sort of merging in the middle. A similar story for this bird, a Eurasian collared dove. Um, they were uh, released, the story is from a pet store in, uh, the, the, in southern Florida from a hurricane and a bunch of them escaped and they sort of populated the country. So this was in the early 80s and I want to cycle through some slides here to show you how they've expanded just since the early 80s. So you can see here that the purple squares are the presence of these birds. Look in southern Florida and watch how they have changed. Um, so this is 93, 96, 99. 2002, they're spreading, 2005, 2008, 2011, and then present day, they've conquered the country. Um, you'll notice that they're not really in Maine, though. For whatever reason, they spread up through Alaska, but not really come, come east, um, but they're coming. Um, this is the state's first record of Eurasian collar dove in Maine. This is in Falmouth in 2013, right, Doug? Um, this is my friend Doug's picture. Obviously, he was there to see the first dove. I was not, uh, but they're coming to Maine, um, as are these birds, some vultures. Um, we're, we have, there are two species of vultures common in the U.S. On the left is our familiar turkey vulture um, with the, the silver behind the wings there. Uh, the lower bird in this picture is another species, the black vulture. You can say they have thicker wings and they have silver on the tips of the, on the sort of their hands uh, rather than the, the trailing edge. Um, black vultures are not common in Maine, but they're common. Um, here's a, a range of black vultures. Um, you can see that they're sort of creeping up through the I-95 corridor following, you know, a dead roadkill on the road. Um, and we know they're coming because even the turkey vulture is a, is a recent addition to the state of Maine. Um, it was just 1982 where uh, Mainers found the first ever turkey vulture nest in the state uh, near Camden. And so uh, following roadkill on the roads, likely tur uh, turkey vultures came up and now are very commonly seen floating around. Uh, we expect black vultures to follow. What you can do with direct interaction, there's tons of things to do. It depends on the bird. Um, don't hunt illegally. Um, don't use lead tackle, please. Um, Maine Audubon is launching a, a, a lead tackle buyback program at certain uh, stores. Check our website to see how you can get a voucher to buy non-lead tackle. It works just as well and it protects birds. So there's lots of things you can do um, to help birds in different ways. And I'm just cruising for time here, so I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, Man-made climate change, of course. Um, how have humans affected bird climate change? Um, uh, here's a bird that we, is much more common now than it used to be. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. It's not a, a, a well-named bird. Um, you can see here underneath the bird's leg, that's the red belly of the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, the red-headed woodpecker is already taken by a different species, so whatever. Um, but this is a bird that is expanding its range into Maine, um, and we know it's because of climate change. You know, climate change is playing a role. Um, this is, was typically thought of as a real southeastern bird, a real sort of uh, epitomized the southeast, but it's now it's changing. Um, here, so you can see that. So um, in, in red is uh, the number of red-bellied woodpeckers seen in the winter in Maine. You can see there really weren't any at all. Starting in 2004, they sort of jumped up. The blue line is New Hampshire. They've had a much more steadier increase. Um, we're not really sure why there's been this sort of jagged up and down in Maine, but the trend is upward very clearly. Um, and we know it's climate change playing a role because of something called Bergman's rule. Um, which says that uh, when there's a population of animal that, uh, that goes from north to south, from the equator to the poles, say, um, that the larger individuals of that population are always toward the poles and the smaller ones are towards the equator. Um, that's a rule that applies to many different species uh, around the world. Um, and we're seeing that same thing happen with, um, with uh, red-bellied woodpeckers. So um, there never used to be red-bellied woodpeckers in Maine in the 50s. Um, the ones that were closest were the biggest red-bellied woodpeckers. Um, now, as there are red-bellied woodpeckers in Maine, those are the largest, and um, the ones that are further, further south are smaller. So we're seeing that that's a very clear temperature um, climate gradation there. Uh, and there's been lots of other species that we know that have moved in, uh, into Maine as the climate and the waters have warmed. 
Um, these are just some headlines that I picked from a quick Google search. Uh, the smooth mud crab is here. The black sea bass is in our waters. Carolina wren is another one uh, that we know uh, is moved up. So um, we are very clearly seeing species um, that are uh, more at home in warmer temperatures, uh, warmer waters coming into Maine um, with the changing climate. Um, some of the best information recently is from a National Audubon report um, called Survival by Degrees. This came out uh, just a few months ago, uh, and it really modeled out into the future um, how habitats change. And so a lot of the modeling, a lot of what people are um, uh, assuming is going to happen to certain bird populations in Maine is based on habitat. So we know that habitats are tied to certain climates and temperatures. Um, you know, where it's very hot and dry, there's desert. Where it's very cold and dry, there's tundra. Uh, where it's wet, there's rainforest. So um, the, the climate dictates the habitat and the habitat dictates the species. So if you can model out different climates, um, you can model out where the habitat would be in the future. Um, and we can see that some, some pretty dire predictions for Maine uh, based on different climate scenarios. This is the common loon here. Um, there are three scenarios. Um, on the left, it's the current, uh, current state. You can see that the orange is where loons live now. Um, the middle side is with a 1.5 degrees difference of change. Uh, and on the right, it's a three degree difference of change. Um, red means the birds aren't there anymore. Um, so you can see that if we allow the climate to warm within three degrees, then the habitat in Maine just simply isn't um, habitable for common loons anymore. Um, and I've gone, I have five minutes left, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, a similar story for uh, bobolinks, um, uh, if we continue to let things go. Um, uh, you know, but this has, uh, there are different factors uh, and sort of angles to this. Um, for example, wood thrush is a bird that, whose range may increase in the state of Maine uh, with a warming climate. You can see that parts of its southern range it'll be pushed out of and it'll move into Maine as Maine um, becomes more southerly and habitable to them. And so climate change means lots of different things to different birds. Um, here, I encourage you all to go to the National Audubon uh, uh, website and check it out. Um, this is um, their slide overall for Maine showing which types of birds will increase or decrease. Um, the biggest hit in Maine is likely to be, to be our boreal forest birds, which is what um, a lot of people go to the range of the Bergen Festival to see. Um, birds like uh, Canada jay, boreal chickadee, spruce grouse, they depend on this deep forest boreal habitat, which is sort of most southern in Maine. Um, as our climate warms, that habitat will be pushed out potentially of the state and the birds with it. And so um, they're, uh, we're, we're watching that and um, working to take action. So some, take some action. Um, thankfully, Maine uh, uh, is doing uh, really great work on climate change right now. Uh, Governor Mills has set up the Maine Climate Council um, to work with um, uh, all kinds of voices in Maine to develop a climate action plan um, to figure out how we can respond to climate change. And we're very proud to have uh, two uh, members of Maine Audubon on the Climate Council, uh, Sally Stockwell and Eliza Donahue, um, and they are uh, uh, working hard. But we encourage you to help out. We really need your voices here because the state needs to know that people are uh, want climate change um, to be stopped and want to protect the birds from from uh, from the effects. Um, we encourage you to come to our website. Go to maineaudubon.org/advocacy. Um, you can sign our petition to the. Maine Climate Council to advocate for a strong plan. Um, and uh, we encourage you to do so. We have lots of other actions on our website. Um, and if you sign up at maineaudubon.org slash advocacy for our action alerts, so we can keep you posted on all that. So sorry for the rush on the second half of the presentation. Thanks for bearing with me through the craziness of the morning. I got two minutes left. Um, so I'd be happy to take questions if there are already in the chat. Um, and um, thank you to Doug and everyone moderating um, and helping me get through the second half without interruption. Um, so great, are there any questions out there? Um, I'm happy to look. And Doug asked, I can't see the chat room for whatever reason. Sorry, so um, we're just slowly getting people entered into the room here. With the okay. Presentation. Um, so in the chat, uh, I can see the chat too. Yeah, there was a good question. Uh, Richard asking yesterday, I saw hundreds of mating horseshoe crabs in Middle Bay. Does that suggest more red knots? Good question. Um, uh, so horseshoe crabs have been here for long, as long as anything has been here. They've been on the planet for millions of years um, and are very common in Maine. You, traditionally, the, the most famous 
uh, breeding areas of them are on the coast of Delaware, for example, um, I've, uh, and are a critical uh, stopping over point for lots of shore birds, including red knots. Um, uh, Horseshoe crabs will, will come and mate during the full moon, lay their eggs in the millions, and um, in, this, in the sand uh, right there in the, on the beach in shallow water, and that's just delicious caviar for these um, migrating birds as they move northward. Um, I, that's a good question. I don't know if, that's, if there's going to be an I mean, if there is an increase in horseshoe crabs because of warming waters in Maine, uh, and the and the shorebirds are able to adapt and understand where the new breeding populations of horseshoe crabs are, then I would imagine there could be increase in um, certain birds as they stop over north. Um, um, I don't know if there's been a sort of scientific following of that so far, but that is possible. Um, I know that we do have um, our own horseshoe crabs here already, um, um, but whether that population is increasing, I'm not sure. Why aren't loon chicks increasing at the same rate as adult loons? That's a great question, uh, one we didn't get to yesterday. Um, uh, a lot of that has to do with um, ranges. And so one thing that's not uh, increasing is the amount of territories going on. Uh, and so um, as, you know, there are only so many birds, loons can actually breed on any lake at any given time. And so uh, although there's many adults back, some of them aren't breeding as much because of the habitat restrictions. And so um, uh, we see uh, uh, one thing we're hoping is that as the loon population of Maine um, increases, some of those birds will expand elsewhere, maybe out of Maine, to um, to uh, populate populate different lakes in different places. So in a lot, of, especially in southern Maine, we're sort of um, almost full on the habitats in the, in the lakes we have. And so um, the underlining message is that loons are doing great, and there are more um, adults in Maine, maybe just not on our lakes. Thank you for, to uh, uh, Reverend Mary Zachary Lang for protecting the bobolinks. It's a, they're a fun bird to have. So, all right, we got through it. Thank you all for joining and getting through the crazy Zoom bombing of the morning. That was insane. Uh, but we are undeterred. We are the Rangely Birding Festival, and we're not going to let some, some uh, silly kids uh, ruin our fun.